Welcome, my name is Andrew Peterson and I am the CEO of the Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia. Uh, this session, the countdown to the Climate COP is being recorded and a recording of the webinar will be provided via our YouTube channel page uh, in probably 24 hours from this date. Uh, in opening, it's customary, particularly of Australian um, authored and originated webinars to acknowledge the lands upon which we are being broadcast to you. Well, interestingly, I'm coming to you from the uh, traditional lands of the Japanese people. I'm currently in Tokyo as part of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia, but uh, development and as part of the global network for WBCSD. But ordinarily, we are being broadcast to you from the land of the Camaragal people, and we acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging, and in particular, welcome any uh, First Nations people who are joining us today. So in just under a week, the yearly United Nations climate talks will kick off in Egypt. And COP27, as the successor to last year's COP26 climate talks in Glasgow, come at a very interesting time because we have an energy crisis, we have witnessed the war in Ukraine, and we also have tensions over Taiwan, which have changed the geopolitical context of these negotiations quite dramatically. Now, despite the impacts of climate change becoming more acute and apparent, COP27 takes place, as I've said, at a very challenging moment with an energy crisis, a cost of living concern, global, geopolitical unrest and economic uncertainty, all holding the potential to slow down the global progress towards delivering the goals of the Paris Agreement. Part of the success of COP27 will depend on whether some of the commitments made in Glasgow are actually acted upon, such as promises relating to strengthening emissions reduction pledges, accelerating the phase out of coal and delivering on climate finance promises to support vulnerable nations. Another test of COP27 will be whether the initiatives launched in Glasgow, such as the Glasgow breakthroughs on innovation, and pledges to cut methane emissions and end deforestation can actually continue to gain in momentum and, I guess more importantly, action and ultimately accountability for success. So despite a difficult context, though, it's critical, we think, that world leaders use the opportunity of COP27 to accelerate progress and remain on track for no more than 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius of warming. And that's why the BCSD is gathering these leaders from business uh, across uh, not just Australia, but across the world to discuss what they view as the priority outcomes from the summit in Egypt. Now, on the screen, you see the, the actual uh, prep that we've been doing for this particular uh, event and looking at this in two ways. The first is a global perspective on the issues and potential outcomes of COP. And uh, moderating that session will be Rachel Allen Barkas, the Managing Editor of FS Sustainability. And joining her, fingers crossed, will be uh, Claire Kasker Cook, the Director of Policy and Advocacy of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And hopefully she is online. I haven't seen it yet, but fingers crossed. She and her colleague in crime, DJ Forza, uh, the uh, campaign manager for Race to Zero Breakthroughs retail campaign will also be on that panel. And Sophie Punter, or Punt, the managing director of policy at We Mean Business Coalition will also be on that panel. And along with Tasman Graham, the MD of Advision, which is a, a division of Wally. We'll then flip to a national perspective, looking from uh, the business perspective of those in Australia on what they see as the issues and potential outcome for the COP. And on that panel, which I will be uh, moderating, will be Mer Dr. Mary Stewart, the CEO of Energetics, Alona Miller, a, par a partner at Gilbert and Tobin Law Firm, Greg Story, the CEO of My Greener Planet, and Michael Barbara, the Director of Business Development at New Forests. So without further ado, let me hand over to Rachel and her panel. Over to you, Rachel. 
Thank you, Andrew. Um, and I am joining you all today from Melbourne, Australia, the traditional lands of the Rwandari people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, and I acknowledge their leaders, past, present, and future uh, emerging. Um, so, to start off very smartly, um, I might just uh, have the opening question and ask our panelists to introduce their organization uh, through the question of why is your organization going to COP? Um, DJ, maybe I'll start with you. Thank you, Rachel. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Great. So the Race to Zero Breakthroughs 2030 retail campaign is part of the UNFCCC uh, backed Race to Zero. We are founded by five leading retailers, Best Buy, H&M, Ikea, Kingfish and Walmart. And the theory of change for us is to activate retail associations to mobilize really hundreds, if not thousands of retailers around the world to set science-based targets and eventually enter the race to zero. So it's really important that we are at COP. We're having a number of panel discussions and attending a number of events to raise visibility for uh, the campaign and including the CEO of IKEA will be on the ground. So lots happening with the retail campaign. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, DJ. Um, and S Sophie, I might uh, obviously the same question to you. Can you introduce your organization and why you folks are going to be at COP? My name is Sophie Punte and I'm with the World, uh, Women, Business, Women Business Coalition. I have a few slides. Is it now the right time to share those or yeah? Okay. Yeah, so I wanted to briefly, I will go really quickly. You'll be getting the PDF version of this slide. So don't worry if you're missing the details of every slide. So our organization organization is a coalition of seven partners, BSR, CDP, Series, CLG, Euro, Climate Group, B Team, and World Business Council of Sustainable Development that came together in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was signed. And the idea was, can we unite business um, to solve the climate leadership by uniting the voice and together working towards having emissions by 2030 and transitioning to net zero economy? And the logic that our coalition applies is that we work between business climate leadership, which we define as ambition, action, advocacy, and accountability, and using that leadership to encourage governments to set better policy and deliver on those. So NDCs, long-term strategies, policies, and regulations. And we call this the ambition loop. The more action business takes, the more policymakers set their policy, that then stimulates business to take more action, et cetera. And where, why we're going to COP is that um, we're trying always that businesses contribute to increased ambition at international events and at national levels to get on track for 1.5. Um, three objectives. First one is that we're trying to get the COP outcome um, to make sure that business has an active voice and an active um, stake in that. Second is that the business climate leadership, sort of those four A's I just mentioned, is reflected in the work program, which is coming up this COP. Uh, the global stock take also being discussed here at uh, the high level expert group um, and the COP outcome itself. And finally, that we have a coordinated business voice through our business pavilion. So these are on our website, but what we've done, we formulated expectations from COP from a business perspective uh, for, for all our coalition partners. And you can find them on there on our website. And at the end of COP, we will do an assessment against these expectations and share that with businesses. So you can receive those through Business Council for Australia. Then we also have a business toolkit, which you make every year for, for major events like COPs, whereby we give companies a political context, expectations, what, su what success looks like from a business perspective, information about the pavilion, the events calendar, key policy messages, communication tools and logistics for COP. And if you would like to receive one, you can you can approach Andrew or send us an email to the email address mentioned here. Um, and then we have the pavilion itself. So we're hosting, we started hosting one last year, which was when I just joined the, the coalition and in, in Glasgow, and we're doing this again. And we're co-hosting this with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and our partners in this year in collaboration with the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action. And it's really good because that means we now have a real active connection to all the, the sectors or systems that the Marrakesh Partnership includes. And that's a formal part of the UNFCCC. And then we have a number of sponsors and, and a, a growing list of supporting partners. 
So what the what the business pavilion will be? This is the map of the of the COP for for next um, next week, and we are um, at the bottom right in where the the, the, mar the marker is, and we have an area of around uh, 400 square meters together with the the bis buildings pavilion, which has 200 square meters. So we have a massive pavilion between us in the blue zone. And the, what we have done is we've got two auditoriums, meeting rooms, a business cafe, and a studio. And our program is then linked to that of the COP presidency, which is Egypt, to the Marrakesh partnership. And then in our own pavilion, we've, we've tried to match the themes. And we have, um, we have our full program available on the website. And we're always looking for, for companies uh, from the global south. And uh, while maybe you're not um, Australia, of course, a developed country, but you feel still very much south. So should any of you be there and you're interested in participating, please let us know. Uh, the theme that we have is to go for the four A's for climate leadership, ambition, action, advocacy, and accountability. And as well on our website, we've identified what are the four things companies, business leaders can do uh, per, for each item to become leaders. And with that, we want to make this pavilion and this theme this year particularly about action. So we're constantly focusing on if we were to have emissions by 2030, what would action look like? For example, if we're going to be having emissions by 2030, we must at least have produced 61% of global electricity from renewable energy sources. And we have similar examples for other sectors. And then what we have is we have a studio in the pavilion where we can take videos of business leaders, policymakers. We are very active on social media, amplifying messages of our partners and creating our own. Uh, we have a, a press uh, press briefings with the media, and we have events and meetings, not just events in the pavilion that are organized by partners, but also bilateral meetings that are behind closed doors where we try to bring a few policymakers and businesses together. So you can join us in the Blue Zone, share your stories, but you can also contact us directly if you want to become engaged. So we're going to COP uh, in full force and uh, hope to be able to represent your, your voice there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie. I know for myself, I've taken down that contact information as a, an interested journalist. So thank you for serving at least this particular member of the audience. Um, finally, Tasman Graham, um, uh, can I can I get from your perspective why an organization like Advisian is going to be going to COP27? Sure, Rachel. So Advisian is the advisory consulting arm of Wally, and at Wally, our ambition is to help deliver a more sustainable world. So participating in COP27 and debate around the energy transition is a critical part of that and living mm -hmm. our purpose. Uh, we're working with our clients um, around the globe to support pretty much every type of renewable energy. We're supporting major car carbon capture and storage and direct air capture projects already. Um, we're helping our clients with the work they're doing to decarbonize uh, you know, their existing activities. So that all means we have a wealth of pragmatic insight and experience not only around the technologies uh, but also the in, you know the massive infrastructure that's needed to get to net zero. So through our participation in COP, we hope we can share this yeah. insight, contribute meaningfully to the conversation, um, you know, and help support the energy transition globally. Uh, we have a senior delegation attending again uh, this year. That includes our group executive director of sustainability, Sue Brown, uh, and our chief financial officer and the head of the region. And also, as we did at COP26, we're hosting a roundtable event for our clients to encourage the type of collaboration needed amongst industry if we want to reach mid-century net zero. Excellent. Thank you, Tasman. So with all of that as prelude to the second conversation, uh, as Andrew said in his introduction, a week can be a very long time in politics, and Lord knows it's been a very long year for 2022, given um, the all of the disruptions uh, that put the EU in unruly uh, when it comes to unruly transition that we're in. Um, given all of that, plus the, six, plus the good news that it appears as though Lula has won election to the presidency in Brazil, so potentially opening up for some, uh, some interesting new pathways um, around biodiversity and natural capital. Um, what does a success look like from this COP? Um, if this is an implementation COP and given sort of the particular posts that your organizations are looking for. Um, DJ, I might circle back and, and go to you. Um, SBTI has very specific commitments under it. Um, so what are you looking to achieve um, and what does success look like from this COP? Sure, well, it gives me an opportunity to mention that last year 
we had the Australia Retail Association join our uh, campaign. And what they've done was they pledged to accelerate the race to zero. And being an accelerator is the official way that industry groups can be part of this campaign. So the accelerator term is an official term. And so they've had a year to um, spark interest and raise visibility with their membership. And it's working really well. They've developed a blueprint. They have webinars. They um, have speaking opportunities. They have, they're helping their members understand what are the pathways on how to get into the race to zero including business ambition for 1.5 or going which is the SBTI or going via the climate pledge or the SME climate hub so Australia is actually a shining example of action um, everything from providing master classes to like I said webinars and raising it in their in their meetings with all of their um, with their hundreds and hundreds of members so that's a great success story uh, last week we announced that Eurocommerce plus an additional seven national retail associations in Europe in Europe, we're joining the pledge. And so now it's all about activating them and actually following the great example of Australia. So we are definitely in action mode. We have 10 retail associations, including the British Retail Consortium, the European uh, 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 Euro, Euro Commerce, pardon me, and also the Australian Retail Association. So that is an engine that we can say will definitely have impact and the number of retailers that set science-based targets and reduce their emissions by 2030. And so what would you like, what would you and your membership base like to see in terms of success, in terms of increased national uh, NDCs, um, policy, uh, anything around adaptation mitigation? What, what will you be looking for from, uh, from COP27 specifically? Well, from the retail sector right now, retailers need support, right? So it's about helping them understand how they're navigating, you know, the climate crisis, the the inflation crisis, lack of uh, skilled employees, all the things that retailers are dealing with right now, currently. But how do we keep sustainability on the agenda and make sure it stays a priority? So that's what the founding members of our campaign, IKEA, Best Buy, Walmart, Kingfisher, and H&M are committed to doing. So helping to raise visibility unlock resources, support these retailers in their journey. Uh, WBCSD, along with Accenture, has created the uh, Race to Zero Retail Center of Excellence, which is an online hub where retailers have a community of practice and all the resources and tools that they would need uh, to start their decarbonization journey, and that they can access through their retail association. Excellent. Thank you. Sophie, same question to you. Um, given the four A's that you outlined with those slides, which is, I think, is a, it's a really useful framing device. Um, what would success look like across those four A's uh, out of Sharm El Sheikh? Well, I, I suppose the, the link again is needs to be laid between businesses and governments. And the one thing, if we talk about ambition, um, I mean, sorry to sound a little bit alarmist, but our worry is that we might be backsliding from COP26, right? So that, that it's not so much that companies will, will reduce the targets as such, but there might delay it. So instead of, oh, instead of 2030, let's make it 2035, right? And we don't have that time to lose. So our, our aim is that the ambition of, of, of companies continues to be set high to say, governments, please do the same, go further, but definitely do not go back. Right? That is the one thing we need to make sure happens. And then second on, on the mitigation is demonstrating the action. What you want to tell people is the train has left the station. We're acting. Maybe it's not going fast enough, but it's going in the right direction. Right. And because the moment you have you lose that uh, ability for people to see that we are acting, we are taking action. If people lose that hope or lose that, oh, it's not going to work anyway. And, and, and they let it slip. That's really worrying. So um, action and that we can demonstrate action by companies showing what are they doing to have emissions by 2030 and by giving the confidence we can do it. Let's not look linearly from the past what has what has been achieved so far, but let's look exponentially to the future. And a lot of the companies I speak to have those examples, right? And they can be really inspiring, inspiring spokesperson. I also think from a company perspective, talking about action, what you're doing and what you have already like plan to do, committed to doing and, and, and invested in doing is a much way, much better way to safeguard yourself from greenwashing accusations, right? Because a lot of companies have made plans and then if they're not following up, people say, yeah, it's just fake, false promises. So it's really important to explain, not just, oh, we have done this in the past, but we're doing this to have our emissions by 2030 or better, right? 
And then when you come to the advocacy is that what we're hoping more and more is that that companies realize that unless they have they have good policy, they're not going to make their actions happen. Yeah. So if you're an Indian company and you want to you want to get to net zero, but if but the government of India, for example, has still said net zero 2060. And then then how are you going to do this? Right. So you, you need to also go to governments to, to, to raise your voice. We want to do this. And we need the governments to support us by doing this and this and this faster. So, for example, setting more stronger renewable energy targets or phasing out internal combustion engines. Like this last week, we just heard from, from Europe that um, ICE vehicles can no longer be sold after 2035. That sends a huge message to the industry and then they can plan. It's that, that uncertainty, that volatility of policy making that makes companies really nervous because they need to invest for 20, 30 years at times or change the entire business model. And you're not going to do that on, on the back of some flaky policy. So policy advocacy is really key. And finally, accountability. Um, you will see that there's going to be a bigger call for disclosure from companies, by companies, and particularly from investors. So you've got the ISSB, that's the International Sustainability Standards Board that was founded. Last COP was announced at our pavilion, yay. <laughs> and um, this year you're going to see more of that. And the idea is, of course, that companies already reporting to CDP, which is about 13,000 right now, that the requirements of the ISSB, if they were to be integrated into that, that would be a really great thing because companies as well, they don't want to disclose to 20 things. They want to disclose to one. So what's really important is not just the mandatory disclosure that goes up to add credibility, but also that it gets embedded into uh, requirements for investors and ultimately legislation. And I know that New Zealand, your neighbor, has required, uh, has, has made mandatory reporting um, a requirement. And I expect that more countries will follow. I'm very hopeful Australia will be too, because once you get the disclosure right, then investors, citizens, NGOs like ourselves can compare apples to apples. So those are the four expectations from us going. Final point is on the loss and damage. The, the real worry is that the loss and damage um, becomes a bra breaking point for developing countries uh, to, to let the, con the negotiations at COP succeed. So that is going to be on the table, as well as finance, which is, of course, linked to, to all of this. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Sophie. And, and Tasman, um, from Advisian's perspective, uh, what would success look like for you and your clients? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, let, let me though, kind of continue to underscore the challenge ahead. You know, no one sensible said the energy transition was going to be easy. And while momentum for action you know, has endured COVID-19 wonderfully, uh, the hard work and the hard times are undoubtedly still ahead of us. So I think there's a reality check at the moment. Uh, you know, yes, we've um, since COP26, we've seen the return of major conflict in Europe and heightened geopolitical tension between the US and China, as was mentioned. Uh, but we've also discovered that modern monetary theory or magic money uh, <laughs> isn't quite so magic. And we're seeing the impact of the investment paralysis caused by ineffectual climate and energy policy of the last 10 years within many countries. Um, so it's not surprising, sadly, that we're seeing the rapid emergency of both inflation and energy poverty. Um, inflation is not going away with the resolution of the Russia-Ukraine war. It's a massive headwind to the implementation of major spends by governments to establish the enabling economic infrastructure like power grids, you know, capable of bringing on significantly more renewable energy. So success, you know, in that backdrop uh, looks like demonstrable global leadership, you know, continuing on the implementation work to achieve the commitments of COP26 from each country. So it's, for me, it's about resolve and realism from each country. And within those countries, not letting perfection out of 2030 get in the way of the good. You know, the, the public of countries can be very easily lost on this journey. Right? So uh, it's, it's how we get to that virtuous cycle that Sophie shared, uh, get that really turning, uh, but without you know, um, going uh, too much like zealots in that. So uh, on a positive note, in Advisian and wider Worley, uh, we're not seeing any waning at the moment in commitment to net zero, which is terrific. Uh, in fact, some, in fact, you know, amongst uh, really all, uh, almost all, if not all, of our clients are increasing their spend right across the board, uh, accelerated certainly in the US by the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, as countries seek to simultaneously now solve for the trilemma of energy transition, security, and affordability. You know, there's 
there's no ability to stay paralysed on uh, energy and uh, climate policy. So, you know, that's starting to kick into gear. But uh, as I said, the hard work of that's ahead of us still. Just uh, randomly, Tasman, in terms of yep. that investment you're starting to see from clients, um, is this just is this new CapEx and OpEx spending that you're starting to see, or is this just sort of tipping over to make sure that resiliency is taken care of and sort of, you know, things are ticking along? Oh, it's a spectrum. And uh, yes, you know, in certain uh, jurisdictions, there's just a race to replace energy right now. So some of that is, you know, uh, going in the wrong direction. But, mm -hmm. you know, by and large, what we're seeing is uh, a significant move to the transformation of our clients, um, you know, in, in their um, efforts to have a future, you know, and a strong future and their early positioning. Um, you know, in respect of renewables, there's like a great exploration gold rush going on of people seeking to get their arms around these resources that, you know, will invariably go through a massive uh, valuation change in the next 10 years. So, you know, we're seeing that, you know, uh, and, um, you know, not ashamedly by, by business, that's, that's, that's good. That's, you know, market's doing the thing. Um, but we're also seeing, uh, you know, in that decarbonisation of their scopes one and two, uh, you know, real investment. So I mean, you can call that OPEX, but it's, you know, significant. Um, and also an increasingly um, interested client base in scope three and um, how they meaningfully contribute to that. And if I just quickly share uh, an iron ore miner client shared uh, recently that, um, you know, in their discussions with China, reducing, uh, or sorry, improving their grades by some few percent of their iron ore exported to China will result in scope three emission reduction that eclipses um, all of their scope one and two emissions reductions in Australia. And they're not using that as an excuse. They're, they're doing it all. You know, they are, they've got significant plans for their scope one and two um, removal, you know, following a, you know, a, a pragmatic uh, a roadmap that we've assisted with. But, uh, you know, it's that, um, all of that. So, so, so we're excited. You know, things are still happening. But, but my early comment was really just to be a little bit careful around the economic headwinds and, and yeah, just, just not letting the perfect get in the way of the good here. We've got to keep everyone on board, right, and not lose people who are, who are really badly affected right now with energy poverty. And then a quick lightning round question each for Sophie and DJ. Um, what one action should businesses be doing now? Don't wait for the end of Shymel Shake, but do it now. Sophie, I'll start with you first. Lightning round answer. One action. And get rid of fossil fuels. And in your scope three, not just in your own. Yeah, look, look all the way in your value chain. It's a collaboration that's going to make it work. So, Excellent. And DJ, lightning round, one action that your, your businesses should be taking right now. Get started and look for help through your industry associations. There's tons and tons of support out there for business to get started. Excellent. Well, thank you to our three international panelists, DJ, DJ Forza, Sophie Punte, and Tasman Graham. Andrew, passing it back to you for the Australian perspective. And grabbing the, uh, the baton from you, Rachel. Thank you so much to our international commentators. Uh, interesting um, observations from Sophie in particular around the, the sheer enormity of this COP. And it's the thing that I think has surprised me in the preparations leading up to this, how much business is interested in attending this COP. We, I think we expected uh, COP26, which was uh, an important COP, uh, an influential COP and a COP of much decision that needed to be made. And this, this COP was supposed to be the so-called implementation, not quite the technical COP, but the implementation COP, which in one sense is not as significant, but um, all reports are that there are more people proposing to attend this COP than even at Glasgow. Now, that is not insignificant. And the other data set is that um, business, more so than ever, is attending this COP. And um, as a late uh, updated item, um, a quadrupling of numbers attending COP15. So if you put the, the narrative of climate and nature together, for example, We've not seen this kind of interest and appetite for business engagement, whether we agree with it or not, whether we think it's uh, uh, sufficiently uh, ambitious or not. In one sense, it doesn't matter. That simple and sheer fact of engagement by business around the international policy fora on now climate and nature 
is quite uh, is quite extraordinary. I've asked our national commentators to join us to give us their thoughts on uh, not dissimilar questions, but there is a, there is a change to one of them. And in starting that, let me start with Mary and asking the same question that uh, Rachel uh, that uh, Rachel Ann did, which is, why are you going to COP? Because you are. So why are you going, Mary? It's Egypt, Andrew, and it's turning into summer. I want to be warm. Okay. Um, energetics, climate risk and energy transition experts. Um, we've been around for 40 years and we've been going to the COP since Copenhagen. Um, we used to go to the COP for a breath of fresh air um, to meet like-minded people and to check in whether the advice that we give to Australia's largest company actually just stacked up with um, what's happening in the global market and with global expectations. I think this COP is going to be a bit different. Um, Australia is no longer in the climate action wilderness. We don't have to go there to measure ourselves from others. Um, the others are coming to Australia. Um, we do still have a bit of catching up to do. Um, so we're going to see what's worked in other jurisdictions from a policy perspective and from a planning and development perspective. I mean, COPs are great. Just go there to get an energy boost and really drink from, from the Kool-Aid, um, the global Kool-Aid, <laughs> to come back refreshed and, and actually push action in Australia next year. And another frequent attender, Ilona Miller. Um, Ilona, there's just so much on your plate at the moment. Uh, a, how do you have time to go? And B, why are you going to this particular COP? Uh, look, uh, Andrew, I think similar to, to Mary, I'm, I'm probably a bit of a um, cop, I, I'll, I'll use the word tragic, but I've, I've been going to COP since 2005 in various different roles, be it negotiating on behalf of governments, providing legal support to government or representing um, the, the business community. Um, this year I'm going in my capacity as um, the climate change lead here at Gilbert and Tobin and we are a corporate law firm who are really supporting a number of our clients on their pathways to decarbonisation, be it clients that have um, you know, investments to make, active actions to take, or the, the banks and other sort of private equity clients that are helping finance that, that decarbonisation. Um, you know, in this capacity, we go to, um, you know, track what's happening in the negotiations because that will have a material impact in some cases on the type of business our clients engage in, particularly in respect of carbon markets and the developing rules around Article 6, um, but also to, um, you know, share experiences, learn from others, be part of those events that are run by the business community, be it WBCSD or um, IETA, um, the International Emissions Trading Association, to be able to sort of see what's happening globally and then how that will inform the um, policy trajectory, but also the investment um, decisions that might flow into the Australian market. So let's let's move to a relatively um, uh, new um, uh, COP attendee, which is uh, Michael. Michael, let's join, get you to join in the space and um, share with us why you and New Forests um, are now frequent attendees at the COP. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, I've only been once before, and that was Madrid. Uh, must have been 2019 actually, December 2019, and it is infectious, I'll say that. I can definitely relate um, to Mary's comments. For, for me and for New Forest, it's just about an opportunity to contribute to the discussion around investment in sustainable forestry and nature-based assets, land use management, um, to you know, contribute towards uh, our clients' climate change targets and, and to have a a discussion around how capital can flow into this sector um, in a meaningful and positive way. And it's a great place to do that. There's people from across businesses, governments, civil society, um, all segments of the economy in attendance. And it's just a fantastic networking opportunity. But, you know, it is, it is an amazing place to be. It's some 70 odd thousand attendees over the two weeks. There's a real atmosphere, there's a real vibe. and. It energizes you and, and makes you remember why um, you love doing what you do. So um, looking forward to it. Thanks for that. Now, Greg, let's let's give them the trick question. Greg, why are you going to COP? Well, we would uh, we'd love to be at COP twenty seven. As you said, it's it, this is a major uh, business oriented COP. 
um, distinct from some of the others. And we see in Australia and globally that business is uh, becoming a driving force in the transition without business on board and without business directly engaged. Governments can't do it alone. And that uh, is true all around the world and it's, and it's true in Australia and it's happening to an ever greater uh, degree in Australia and elsewhere. We'd love to be at COP, um, but we are too busy helping clients in Australia uh, getting to net zero. And so we've done the best, the next best thing, Andrew. We've appointed um, you as our representative through the BCSDA uh, to be there for us, to represent us at COP and uh, represent us in other forums uh, within Australia and globally. And uh, we are looking forward to maintaining that contact with you during the COP program and, and hearing your insights and feedback. Thank you, Greg. And that was spoken for and on behalf of the Greg story for I Like Andrew Peterson Party. All right. So let's move to the next phase of the, the questions. And it's uh, a con context question around policy in Australia. And we'll go back to, I think, Alona first, which is give us your um, pricey of the current developments by the Albanese government since the federal election. And um, within that, I guess, an observation around what you think is the, the motivators, the incentivizers, the enablers around that particular policy framework. So, Alona. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, I, I think most people would be aware that um, when the Albanese um, government was elected, one of the first things they did was to update Australia's nationally determined contribution to put in place a more ambitious target for 2030, being a reduction of 43% below um, 2005 levels, um, and also sort of recommitting to net zero by, by 2050. In addition to submitting the revised NDC, um, Australia has also now passed legislation, the Climate Change Act, and that legislation enshrines the target, but also puts in place a mechanism to ratchet up our targets based on advice from the Climate Change Authority, who will you know, provide that advice to inform subsequent NDCs and also places um, new um, and strengthened objectives on a number of agencies that are helping deliver some of the um, objectives in terms of reaching those targets. For example, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, the Renewable Energy Agency, um, Infrastructure Australia and, and others. So I think we've got a now um, quite prescript, well, quite um, um, a change in terms of that high level policy setting um, and, and the, the, the process around, um, you know, pursuing ambition. But in all uh, the other sort of activities that the government has embarked on at quite a rapid pace is a number of mechanisms to implement those policies as they apply to different sectors. So, for example, in our industrial sector, we're seeing a review of the safeguard mechanism. We're seeing review in respect of our approach to electric vehicles in the transport sector, um, significant funding going into rewiring the nation to enable the scaling up of renewable energy to meet targets of 82% renewable energy by, by 20, 2030. So the government is sort of moving apace with this reform agenda, um, which I think is, is really important. And um, I, I think as we take that to, to Glasgow, as Mary said, we're coming to, to COP27 with now hopefully a new perspective. And um, uh, I think we will be looking at um, perhaps a better reception from the international community because we are stepping up with, with our ambition. I think it was Shamil Sheikh, not Glasgow, but sorry, it's, it's like That's the one. <laughs> I, I call it the Prince Charles factor. Yes, yeah. we haven't we haven't got used to the fact that we need to move on from Glasgow. Huh. Um, let's uh, let's bring the other three back and ask for reflections also about that particular issue, which is the um, the policy work of the current um, federal government. Uh, we'll go back to Greg first. Um, what's your observation in relation to these announcements, and what impact, if any? Um, do they make to the um, the enterprise that is my greener planet? And you might just give um, our audience 
just a quick thumbnail of um, who who your organisation is, Greg. Thank you. What, what we do uh, very quickly um, up front is uh, provide fractional ownership of renewable energy assets for companies and individuals and organisations. So we provide fractional shared ownership of solar farms and wind farms, um, and that enables the subscribers, the, the joint owners, to uh, obtain the carbon credits directly, as well as uh, receiving the, the revenue from the sale of the energy to the grid. So it's a unique structure and uh, providing direct access to carbon credits um, for, uh, for everybody. What happens at the, at the government level, of course, is not unimportant. What is far more important, though, is what does happen at the corporate level. And in Australia, uh, that has, we, we, we have lagged uh, Europe, in particular Germany, but we're catching up and catching up very quickly. It has been driven in Australia by shareholder activity, and there's a, many activist shareholders. And at the other end of the spectrum, it's been driven by consumers. And the company's in the middle, and, uh, and they're being told uh, in no uncertain terms that uh, from shareholders and from their customers, we want to see action on climate change. We want to see you getting to net zero. Um, many companies have, a, have difficulty in doing that. They don't have staff uh, involved in ESG and sustainability like the major companies. They are looking for support. Uh, they find it a complex and and um, and frustrating area. It's costly. Uh, they're looking for cost-effective solutions, which is which is what we do. Um, and they're looking for support in in um, in how to reduce their emissions, how to measure their their carbon footprints, and how to achieve neutrality. Um, and so it's it's happening regardless of what happens at the government level. It's. Um, uh, it's quite a change that's occurred in Australia, um, and it's uh, it's happening very quickly now. There's uh, there's great imperative from companies of all levels, large, small, and and SMEs to get to net zero. And it's a it's a it's a refreshing uh, environment that we're now working in. It's seen as as ex broadly accepted across the political spectrum as well as the corporate and consumer spectrum there's um uh there, there, there's there, there's there's a great fan base to get there and uh, and it's a great and exciting industry to be working in mm. yes I, I i love that word excitement there is a palpable sense of excitement i would agree with you entirely michael let's bring you in and interestingly the space that you work in and your company works in is at a very interesting um, intersection of both climate and nature uh, and uh, we have a country and a, and a government that is um, moving quite quickly on both fronts what 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 has it mean meant thus far since the election if any to the um, the investment portfolio approach of New Forest and what could we see in the future uh, if some of the work that uh, is promised by this government actually eventuates? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Well, it would be rude of me to let the politicians off lightly. So I would say that there's always more that can be done um, from a policy standpoint, but we are seeing, um, I think, positive signs of an increasing recognition that sustainable forestry practices can play in Australia, both in terms of its contribution towards climate change, but also towards other environmental aspects. Um, so certainly uh, in that uh, forestry, uh, sustainable forestry practice can offer a lot more than being something that can produce carbon offsets. Forestry um, is, has a much bigger role to play in the bioeconomy, providing sustainable fiber that can be used in the built environment for energy, for chemicals, for clothing, for a whole range of different products. And so um, getting recognition of that and seeing policy support to grow Australia's forest sector, which is a provider of jobs in rural areas, contributes towards livelihoods, has positive um, outcomes for nature, obviously when it's done right, is the direction that we want to see policy 
um, move towards. And we did see in the budget a hundred million dollar commitment towards the National Institute for Forest Products Innovation, um, which will invest in R and D around wood based technologies. So very positive, I think, to start moving away from a traditional, you know, um, stick frame and lumber sort of forest sector to something that is really investing in the future of of what wood-based products can deliver. I think just beyond that though, um, out of an implementation-based COP, um, what we need to do is see reduced policy uncertainty and reduce perceived risk in carbon markets. Um, we want COP27 to bring about more clear and transparent carbon policy outcomes that allow the business community to act with certainty, invest with confidence, and you know really contribute to action on climate change. So I hope that the government's getting that message from the business community that we want policy certainty. And I know that Mary touched on it. Um, and so I think that's just another really important factor that we have to continue to put pressure on. Thanks, Michael. Let's move now to Mary. Mary, you, you work with a lot of clients in a lot of different sectors. What's been the observation they've made to you around, I guess, the sentiment, the appetite, the excitement is Greg it um, since the um, since the change of government in May of this year. I mean, the change of government. I was going to make a terrible Halloween joke about. Go on, go on, make it, make it. Make well, it, make it. welcoming our carbon price back from the dead, but oh. it's actually true. Um, there is clarity now and there's certainty for governments and we'd worked with with some of Australia's biggest companies helping them understand what their net zero trajectory looked like um, and now that there is policy certainty they're starting to to invest the money to drive that change through but increasingly recognizing that it's too late to PPA and offset our way out of this problem and companies are starting to engage with the really complicated piece of getting rid of the, the emissions themselves um, and working out just how complicated that is and um, taking on the really, really hard challenge of delivering the net zero outcome. Um, but with that comes opportunity. I mean, if you're looking at a risk of that magnitude, um, there's huge opportunity that comes with it. And as companies investigate in, in increasing detail how to decarbonize their business model, they're definitely finding new ways forward um, under a very uncertain geopolitical and, and financial um, setting at the moment. So mm. it's not easy. And there, I think we're seeing a, a separation, a difference in the two sets of clients out there. There's the brave and there's the, the potentially maybe the realist um, and, and the companies who actually are looking to 2035 as opposed to the companies that are only looking to 20, 2028 or 2029. So with that, with that in mind, the, the last question for this panel is very much around that, um, that realistic ambition and it's couched in the context of what does success look like for this COP. Mary, what are you going to be looking out for when you're there as to a signal of success? I mean, the two things that, that are worrying me at the moment and the two things I don't think companies are paying enough attention to are resilience. And, and across the board, we haven't seen enough happening um, in any of the of the COP negotiations about what does resilience mean? How do you make your company ready to operate at one and a half or if we're looking at this now 1.8 degrees? What, what we not see, we're seeing the loss and damage stuff on, on the on the pri on, on, on the public sector and on people, but we're not seeing companies address that risk. So I would like to see something that speaks to how companies are doing this more informed TCFD. I mean, there is money in the budget for, for some type of disclosure. The other side of it is, is not IWSB, but it's IAAB. IWSB speaks to the narrative of your report. The IAAB speaks to the numbers. And I think companies need to watch what's happening very closely there. Because, I mean, the one, one rule in the IAAB is that your investors can set your materiality limit. You're not going to set your materiality mm -hmm. limit for your climate-related disclosures. Your investors are. So I think, yeah, companies need to watch those two things very closely. I mean, the, if I was going to say the one single thing that will demonstrate success to me from this COP is Australia getting a COP in two years' time. Because if you <laughs> saw what happened in the UK around the Glasgow COP um, and just how business got behind the ambition of the UK presidency, 
um, understanding what happens with the timing of the new set, setting, the new NDC and the next round of elections. It is a prime time for Australia to hold a COP that could really just enhance business um, ambition. So for me, that would be a successful COP. You're giving a whole new meaning to the the um, slogan, it's time. Very interesting. And um, let's, uh, let's go back through our panel. And Michael, first to you, what, when you're at COP, will success look like, not just for New Forest, but for the, the enterprise of the work being done by the industry and its contribution to the, um, to the commitments under the Paris Agreement? Yeah, I think for me, success would be seeing through the short-term issues that are faced by the world and the world will always face short-term issues and being a recognition that climate change isn't um, a problem that will simply go away. It needs credible, meaningful action across our economy, across different countries um, and across the world. And so although there is a lot happening at the moment, um, in our world that we touched on at the very beginning of this webinar, I think um, success to me is a recognition that um, despite all of these challenges that we are faced, we can't ignore this one because it's probably one of the biggest ones we'll face. That with nature loss, uh, just imperative uh, to our society and to our economy. And so for me, it's about maintaining that ambition, um, not hiding behind some of the things that are, that are going on in the world at the moment. So. That would be a great outcome as an industry and as a sector. I think just again, continuing to have a mature and science-based discussion around the role that sustainable forestry practices and investment can play in contributing towards climate change. Not just face the challenge, but let's embrace the challenge. Yeah. All right, Greg, conscious that you're going to be watching me from afar at the COP, uh, elucidate what that, that success does look like. What what will you be wanting me to tell you about what success looks like? We're hoping to see that there's going to be um, further progress at, at the corporate level. It, it, as I said earlier, without uh, corporate involvement, um, governments can only achieve so much. In Australia, there has been over the past reluctance and resistance and suspicion about... Uh, uh, about net zero, about climate change, that has all but disappeared, um, and the and and business now in Australia is seeing the opportunity that lies before it in achieving net zero, and that opportunity lies in expanding their markets, uh, increasing their share of of markets, um, making greater profit. Uh, beating competitors, adding points of differentiation, uh, product differentiation in how they're marketing their products and services, uh, if they can achieve net zero and beat their competition. And they are realising, um, at least with us, that the costs are not enormous. The complexities can be um, reasonably quickly overcome and they're embracing the opportunity that is now presented by achieving net zero. And that's, that's, the, that's what we see as the great excitement in Australia, and we're seeing that around the world, and we are hoping that comes to the fore um, and is presented as a real opportunity for business at COP27. Thank you for that, and I'll paraphrase that as action on natural steroids. All right, so, uh, Ilona, last comment to you. And conscious as am I that having been to so many of these, success can be measured in millimetres on occasion rather than metres or kilometres. Um, what are you looking for in terms of success? From, from my perspective, it's very much about maintaining the primacy of the multilateral process and that the ability of countries to move together on, on ambition. Um, I know that that might, I'll unpack that a little bit, but I mean, effectively, we are looking at how you get, you know, 196 countries to continue more moving forward to keep increasing ambition and driving um, towards, uh, you know, limiting warming to one and a half degrees. And that is very precarious um, in terms of the relationship between different, between different countries in the negotiations. 
whilst Paris was supposed to sort of remove the bifurcation between developed and developing countries, there still is very much a relationship that is based on trust to um, ensure that, um, you know, that the um, developed countries will continue to take the lead and provide a lot of the finance that is going to be needed to help um, not just adapt to climate change in, in developing countries, but also to enable the, um, you know, the decarbonisation pathways and mitigation solutions to be, be deployed um, and, and adequately financed. And on the agenda for this COP uh, are two issues which are quite central to that. One is finance and the other is loss and damage. Um, success will be the ability for the Egyptian presidency to steer the path through those issues with, without um, leading to a loss of trust between, between countries. And there will always be, um, you know, saving face at the, the last minute if things do go awry, and we've seen that at, at other COPs. But, um, you know, a, a big push from the developing country parties um, is to try and establish a financing facility for loss and damage, um, something that is, is not necessarily um, supported um, you know, full in in its in the, the proposed form by um, a number of developed economies, and so that is going to be a really tense discussion. And um, you know, if that doesn't isn't resolved successfully and diplomatically, um, it could be problematic. Similarly, we're working towards the developing the process to set the new long term goal on on climate finance um, for for twenty that will kick off from twenty twenty five. You know, the 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 original goal of 100 billion by 20 um, per year by 2020 hasn't been met, and so there is. So we're starting from a base of concern and sort of lack of trust to some extent on on those issues, and so there'll need to be a real step up in terms of thinking through how that process will be be set going forward. I know these are quite sort of technical negotiation issues, not necessarily sort of ones that the business community would be following first and foremost. But if there is a breakdown on these issues, it impacts on ambition, it impacts on the ability and the um, or, and the, the willingness of governments to step up further as they look at ratcheting up um, subsequent NDCs. So I think that's going to be a really important issue and success will be the presidency navigating that. Absolutely. And if you think that uh, the parties and the non-parties and the observers and the NGOs that are attending this and going to see it all wrapped up on day two or three and then go snorkeling, you are sadly, sadly mistaken. There's much to be done. Um, I guess a pent up excitement and expectation that it, things will happen, but you just never know. And that, that is in one sense, the, the strength and the, the weakness of the, um, the UN process in all of its manifestations. A big thank you to the speakers, to Rachel for moderating, to Sophie, to Clea in absentia. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't join us, but we, we will see her very soon. To DJ, to Tasman, to Mary, to Michael, to Greg, and to Alona, a big thank you, thank you, thank you. Hugs, kiss, and um, um, distant love pouring out from here in Japan to you back in Australia or elsewhere in the world. And look forward to seeing a number of you uh, in the not too distant future in another part of the world where we will aim to um, give all that we possibly can to send positive vibes, thoughts, and our views and actions as to what can happen. Uh, this is not the end though. And um, let me assure you that in your chat, in the chat function, you will see a link to our website. We have uploaded the WBCSD um, page on the action and work program that's going to happen during the course of the COP. Uh, to those who are BCSDA members, you already have access to a platform that gives you a daily update as to what's going on. Sophie, I can assure you that I've uploaded all of the program of WMB and WBCSD now onto our BCSDA platform with links so people, even if they can't attend, can where possible uh, watch in a hybrid fashion those that are going to be made available. There is just so much to get across, so much to absorb. But in that sense, that to me is the exciting and positive part of what we're going to be seeing over the next two weeks. And finally, if you haven't registered, 
for our nightly For You program in Australia at 6 p.m. every night at 9 a.m. in downtown Sharm El Sheikh time. There will be a, a program called G'day Sharm El Sheikh, which builds on last year's G'day Glasgow, where we will give you a sense of what's happening, why it's happening, and what's going to happen next each and every day of the COP. So please go on to our website, and if you haven't already, register and share, 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 because it is uh, quite a thing to watch, can I assure you, particularly with the different viewpoints and the different insights that we get each and every day. And finally, look out for the 10th of November. There's going to be a big announcement by BCSD Australia of a report uh, around ambition, action and accountability, which uh, wraps up a number of the comments and, and thoughts that have been shared with you today. For now, though, thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you on another platform in another part of the world in the not too distant future. As always, stay safe, stay COVID safe, and we'll see you next time. I'm Andrew Peterson. Thanks for joining. Bye for now.